be thy name in all the earth. Father God, we come to you this morning to just to give you thanks, first of all. We thank you, Father, for watching over us last night, waking us up to the rise of a new day. Father, we thank you for all the spiritual blessings that we enjoy in this life through your Son, Jesus Christ. And we thank you, Father, this morning for the opportunity to come together even though it's digitally, to worship and to give you praise this morning. Father God, may the things that we say and do be acceptable into your sight, and through what we give you this morning, that you will receive all the glory and the honor. Bless us as we go into this worship experience. It is in the name of Jesus we pray it. Amen. Yeah. 
Only you are worthy, Lord. Only you are worthy, and only you are wonderful. Only you are wonderful. Chapter 1. And we're going to begin our reading at verse number 30 today and read through verse number 38. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary. For thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for once again allowing your children to humbly approach your throne of grace. Father, first and foremost, we come asking for forgiveness of sin. And also, Father, we would like to offer thanksgiving for all that you have allowed us to this point. We pray, Father, that you continue blessing us as our hearts are steadied on today's worship. We pray, Father, for those that are sick and shut in, Father, and we pray that you always bring them to our remembrance so that we can comfort them in their hour of need. We pray also, Father, for the speaker of the hour. We pray that all that you have given him understanding to study, Father, that it comes to his remembrance as he parse out to your people, thus saith the Lord. We pray that what he says will enlighten those that are listening today online and we pray, Father, that it will bring souls to your harvest. We ask also, Father, that you will just let us pray for the leadership of this world, Father. Those that are in high places, Father. We ask that we pray for their guidance and their health. But most of all, Father, we pray that they understand that you are the reason they are in the position they are in. And that they go throughout their day not being wicked towards the people, but giving them a 
way to be comforted as they walk throughout their days, Father, trying to do their daily activity. And we ask, Father, that us as your children never be hindered when we try to give those that are our neighbors, our friends, and our family the good news, which is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we thank you once again for all that you have allowed us. And we pray, Father, that we can continue to grow in your grace and in your love. In Jesus, the Holy Spirit, in your name, we pray. Amen. I woke up this morning with my mind. space of the Church of Christ at Northside in Detroit, Michigan. To our visitors, we are just so glad that you've joined us this morning and we do consider you our honored guest. And it's our hope and prayer this morning that your visit with us will be strengthening and encouraging and edifying 
and that you will want to come back and be with us because you have benefited by being with us this morning. We invite you to take advantage of all of our worship and fellowship and study opportunities with the Church of Christ at Northside. And you have an open invitation. And wherever you find yourself able and available, and just come on back and be with us as soon and as often as you can. God has truly been good to us. He has truly blessed us. Uh, he's given us life and health and strength and if you ever want evidence of that fact, just consider that for at least one more time. You are on this side of the timeline of life, and you are being seen and not being viewed. But I ask that you will pray with me, and then we'll be into our message for the morning. Father God, we come to you right now. We want to give you thanks for all of the many blessings of life. We're so thankful for life and health and strength and all of the, the earthly blessings that you've given us. But even more importantly, Father, your spiritual blessings that you so graciously bestow upon us that we enjoy each and every moment of our lives through our relationship with you that was secured by your son, Jesus Christ. Father God, we're, we're thankful for this opportunity that you've given us to to come together in this digital space to worship and to praise and to lift your name. For we recognize that you and you alone are worthy. And Father, right now as it befalls me, I pray, Father, that you will keep me behind the cross, that you will hide me there, and that it's not my words that are heard, but your words, that it's not my will that is done, but your will, that through it all you may receive all of the glory and the honor this is our prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. This morning, I'm going to invite your attention, and I ask you that, that you would join with me in the first chapter of the gospel account as recorded by the physician Luke. Luke chapter 1. And I'm going to ask you if you would join me at verse number 30. Luke chapter 1. And we're going to begin our reading at verse number 30 today and read through verse number 38. In Luke chapter 1, beginning at verse 30, the Bible reads this way. And the angel said unto her, Fear not, Mary, for thou hast found favor with God. And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. He shall be great, and shall be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father David. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Then said Mary unto the angel, How shall this be, seeing I know not a man? And the angel answered and said unto her, The Holy Ghost shall come upon thee, and the power of the highest shall overshadow thee. Therefore also that holy thing which shall be born of thee shall be called the Son of God. And behold, thy cousin Elizabeth, she has also conceived a son in her old age. And this is the sixth month with her, who was called barren. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. And Mary said, Behold the handmaid of the Lord. Be it unto me according to thy word. And the angel departed from her. Many years ago, a hymn writer by the name of Charles Wyckoff penned the following words. There's a name above all others, wonderful to hear, bringing hope and cheer. It's the lovely name of Jesus, evermore the same, what a lovely name. What a lovely name, the name of Jesus, reaching higher far than the brightest star. 
sweeter than the songs they sing in heaven. Let the world proclaim, what a lovely name. The name he refers to is the name Jesus. It's a name that we know well. It was a name that was known well in his own day. It was a common name. It was the name of one of the greatest heroes in the history of Israel, Joshua. While Joshua is the Hebrew, uh, Jesus is the Greek, and they both mean the same thing. Jehovah, or God, is salvation. And when he was born 2,000 years ago in Bethlehem, there were many other children in Israel who had the name Jesus. But I guarantee you this morning that there were none like him. And I want to draw our attention this morning to what the angel said to Mary when he visited her to give her the amazing news that she, a virgin, would give birth to the Son of God. You see, when the angel came to Mary, he told her to name the child Jesus. The angel also visited Joseph, who was her betrothed, some time later to tell him the same thing. Over in Matthew chapter 1 and verses 20 and 21, the Bible reads, While he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Once he was born, when he was eight days old, Mary and Joseph took him uh, to be uh, circumcised after their custom. And on that day, they obeyed the voice of the angel and called him Jesus, according to Luke chapter 2 and 21. And for a few minutes this morning, I, I want us to examine that name together because the name Jesus tells us a lot about who he is and what he came to do. And I want to just deal with what that name declares to us this morning. And I want to just deal with the topic today, the declarations in his name. The declarations in his name. First of all, his name declares his identity. Look again at verses 32 and 33, where the Bible says he shall be great and shall be called the son of the highest. And the Lord God shall give unto the throne of his father David to him. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever and of his kingdom shall be no end. First of all, we find there that his name declares that he's the son of God. Verse 32 says that he shall be called the son of the highest. This baby, this particular Jesus would not be like any other. He would be the son of God, the eternal son who had existed with his father from eternity past, would step into time and be born through the womb of a virgin. The ancient prophecy of Isaiah would be fulfilled in the person of Jesus. Isaiah 7 and 14 says this, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, 
a virgin shall conceive and bear a son and shall call his name Emmanuel. Now that word Emmanuel means simply God with us. And that's who Jesus is. He's the son of God. He's God in human flesh. He is God with us. Just like John declared in John chapter 1 and uh, verse 14, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. And when you look at his name, Jesus, you are naming God. But not only is he the son of God, verse 32 also tells us that he's the king of Israel. It declares that to us. Verse 32 says that the Lord God shall give unto him the throne of his father, David. And this Jesus, born to humble people of humble means, would be a direct descendant of their most honored king, David. But even more than that, he would be the fulfillment of God's promise to King David a thousand years earlier. This Jesus would one day sit on the throne of David and be crowned King of Kings and Lord of Lords. But unlike every other king in the line of David, this King, King Jesus, would reign forever. And one day this king will return in glory and he will rule the world, as Revelations 19.15 says, with a rod of iron. And when you name that name Jesus again, you are calling the name of the king of kings. But there is something else you should see here. Verse 33 lets us know and declares to us that he is the fulfillment of prophecy. Verse 33 tells us that he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever. And this particular phrase reaches far back beyond even the time of David to the time of Jacob. And it brings to mind the words that Jacob spoke to his son Judah just before he died. Genesis chapter 49 and 10 tells us that the scepter shall not depart from Judah, nor a lawgiver from between his feet until Shiloh come, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. What's going on here is this. As Jacob lay dying, he tells his son Judah that his descendants would be the rulers of the people of Israel. He's told that ultimately one known as Shiloh would come. And that name Shiloh simply means he whose it is. It means that one day, the supreme ruler will come and he will be the possessor of the people and of all other things. Jacob then goes on to say, and unto him shall the gathering of the people be. Now that word gathering is a phrase in the original language that refers to obedience and cleansing and purging. In essence, this supreme king will be reverenced by the people. He will cleanse his people. He will purge his people and claim them for his own. And this baby named Jesus is the fulfillment of that prophecy. And when you say the name Jesus, when you declare that name, you're talking about the one who perfectly fulfills all of the ancient prophecies concerning the Messiah, the Savior, and the Christ. But there's a fourth thing 
that we see in those verses. We see in that verse number 32 that he's declared to be the champion of humanity. That angel, when he was talking to Mary, says this, he shall be great. And that word simply means to be great in importance and in estimation. No other birth in human history was as monumental as the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ. And when he came into the world, when he came from heaven and took his place on earth, he took his place as the greatest of the great. That first man that we ever find in human history was a miracle, Adam, because he was made in the image of God and because God formed him in the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life according to Genesis chapters 1 and 2. But that man sinned, and he brought sin and death and condemnation upon all of his descendants. He brought shame and disgrace and curse upon all of the world and all of his offspring. But Jesus, this second Adam, fixed everything that the first Adam broke. You see, when Jesus was born, God was made in the image of man. When Jesus was born, he was without sin. He lived without sin. And in his death, he died for sin. The second Adam was even a greater miracle than the first Adam. Because he caused light to shine out of darkness. He caused life to spring forth from death. He caused salvation to destroy condemnation. And according to Isaiah 9 and 6, He's the champion of all humanity. And when you declare the name of Jesus, you're talking about a name that declares that he's our hero. His name declares his identity. But the name Jesus also declares his poverty. The name Jesus also declares his poverty. Back up with me to Luke chapter 1 and beginning at verse number 26. Luke chapter 1, verse number 26. Bible reads, and in the sixth month, the angel of Gabriel was sent from God into a city of Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin espoused to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. And the angel came unto her and said, Hail, thou that art highly favored, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. These verses... Bible tells us that the angel came to a young maiden girl by the name of Mary. It tells us that she was engaged or betrothed to a man named Joseph who was a carpenter. And we know that Jesus was born into a family of meager means. And when we examine his birth, we learn that he was born in a manger when he was born, his mother laid him in a trough that was used to feed barnyard animals. And she was forced to do this because the Bible lets us know that there was no room for them in the inn. Now, you need to know something about the inn. See, the inn was not like our hotels and even our motels of today. When you talked about an inn in Bible times, you weren't talking about the Westin. 
you were talking about the, the four seasons or the Hyatt Regency. See, the ancient inn was a seedy place in the seedy part of town where poor travelers would seek lodging for the night. See, those who had wealth would seek to rent shelter in private homes or, or in more suitable places. But poorer folk who had uh, no means to do that went to the inn. You see, they didn't go to the Hyatt. They went to Burt's Motor Lodge, Motor Lodge. And the family of Jesus couldn't afford the luxurious place. So they were forced to go where the poor people went. But we find that when they arrived at the end, it was already filled to capacity. So they had to seek shelter in an even lower place. They were forced to spend the night with the animals. And it was there that Mary delivered the Son of God. And you need to know that that name, Jesus, is a name that's fully associated with poverty. It reminds us of the sacrifices that he made for his people. Uh, uh, Paul lets us know in 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9, For ye know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, Yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. It reminds us that while he was the creator of all things, when he was on earth, he possessed nothing that wasn't given to him by somebody else. Luke 8 and 3 lets us know that he lived off the gifts of those who cared about him. Bible lets us know that when he was a child, God commanded Joseph to take Mary and, and, and Jesus to Egypt. And, and to finance that trip and to provide for him, God moved the wise men to make a long and a treacherous journey to Bethlehem, with their gifts of gold and frankincense and myrrh, according to Matthew chapter 2. Bible lets us know also in Matthew 17 and 27, when it came time for Jesus to pay his tax, he got the money from the mouth of a fish. Bible goes on further in John chapter 19, verses 23 and 24, that even when he died, the only possession that he had was an expensive garment, and even the soldiers gambled for that. While he lived, nearly every significant event in his life in Scripture, we find that he utilized something that was borrowed or that had been intended for somebody else's use. Luke 5 and 3 lets us know that he borrowed a boat from which he preached. Matthew 6 and 14 tells us he borrowed a house in which he lived. Mark 11, 1 through 11 tells us he borrowed a donkey on which he rode. Mark 14, 13 through 17 tells us that he borrowed a room in which he celebrated the Passover. He didn't even die on his own cross. Matthew 27, 26 says he, the cross that he died on was borrowed and the tomb that he was buried in was a borrowed tomb. But you need to catch and understand this this morning. He gave up his claim to all things that he created so that we might be given all things. He who made it all, who owns it all, willingly laid it all down so that we who had nothing could be the heirs of all things. And we need to praise God that his name declares his poverty because through his poverty, we become rich. His name declares his identity. 
His name declares his poverty. And his name also declares his ministry. Look again at verse number 31. The Bible says this, And behold, thou shalt conceive in thy womb, and bring forth a son, and shall call his name Jesus. Again, get this. The angel tells Mary, to name her son Jesus. And that name literally means Jehovah is salvation. His name declares his ministry in the world. The name tells us what he came to do. Matthew's account, Matthew chapter 1 verse 21 when the angel came to Joseph, he said it like this. And he shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. His ministry simply was that. Luke writes it further in his gospel account, where Jesus declared himself, I have come to seek and to save that which was lost. And how does Jesus accomplish the salvation of people? He would accomplish it by going to the cross in their place where he will be judged by God in their stead. You need to grasp this this morning. Jesus was a great teacher, but Jesus didn't come to this world to teach. And nobody ever talked like him, but that wasn't his purpose. Jesus was a great physician. He was a great healer. But Jesus didn't come to this world simply to heal, though he healed every sickness that he encountered. Jesus even raised the dead. But that wasn't the purpose he came into this world although he broke up every funeral that he ever went to. Though Jesus performed many miracles while he was on this earth, but he didn't come simply into this world to perform miracles, although he accomplished many of them. And we need to grasp something this morning. All four of those things that I just mentioned, other folk did as well. Many people taught, even during the time Jesus taught. Many people performed miracles of healing, some even while Jesus was performing those miracles. Well, I got you on this one, preacher. Uh, he raised the dead. Nobody else could do that. People raised the dead before Jesus walked the earth and raised the dead after Jesus walked the earth. Elijah and Peter come to mind. But watch this. While he did all of those things, the primary reason for Jesus even coming to earth was to die on the cross and give his life a ransom for sinners. Jesus himself declared that he came to this world to die for those he loved. John 10 and 11 says this, I am the good shepherd. The good shepherd giveth his life for the sheep. Every second Jesus lived, from the second he was conceived, until he cried, it is finished on the cross, was for the purpose of leading him to Calvary's cross. And to make it even more personal this morning, you are the reason that he left heaven. You are the reason he took upon himself human form. You are the reason he lived as a man. You are the reason he died. You are the reason that he rose again. He came here for you. He lived for you and he died for you 
and he rose again for you. Everything he did, he did it for you. Here is what he said himself. John 10 and 10. I am come that they might have life and that they may have it more abundantly. And when we say the name Jesus, it's a name that declares the great price that he paid to save us. We're remembering his boundless and his unconditional love. We're calling to mind his selfless sacrifice for sin. When we breathe that name, we're talking about the God who loved us so much that he bore our sins in his own body on the cross. His name declares his identity. His name declares his poverty. His name declares his ministry. But there's a fourth thing that we find here in this passage. His name declares his glory. Look at verse 33 again with me. Luke writes, And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Luke lets us know that the angel tells Mary that her son will reign. And that word reign refers to a king who rules in majesty and glory. And this reminds us again that Mary's baby would be no ordinary baby. It reminds us that Mary was giving birth to the king of kings and the Lord of lords. And while Jesus reigned, and excuse me, while Jesus lived in this world, no one recognized his majesty. Nobody recognized his glory. Nobody recognized his authority. No one really saw him for who he was. You see, some looked at him and saw other things. Mark 6 and 3 tells us that the Jewish leaders looked at him and saw a poor Jewish carpenter. Luke 23 and 5 tells us that Jewish leaders again looked at him and saw a revolutionary. They saw somebody who stirred up the people. John 11 and 37 tells us that those around the tomb of Lazarus saw him as a healer when they looked at him. John 6 and 15, uh, those who... Uh, 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 were at the feeding of the 5,000, uh, uh, saw something in Jesus that they wanted. They wanted an earthly king. John 19 and 6 tells us that Pilate, when he looked upon him, saw an innocent man. There were a few people who, who saw him and, 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 and proclaimed the Son of God. Uh, uh, Luke 23, 47 tells us that the centurion looked at him when he was dead on the cross and, and saw a righteous man. But nobody saw him for who he really was. Now, now Peter and James and John caught a glimpse of his glory on the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17, but they didn't even fully understand just who he was. He lived and died as God walking among men, and very few had even the slightest idea who he was. But all of that will change one day because there's a day coming when all the world will know who he is. You see, when he returns in glory, even his enemies, according to Revelations 19 and Revelations 20, will know who he is. When he reigns in glory, everybody is going to know about it. Paul tells it this way 
in Philippians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verses 9 and 11. He says, Wherefore God also hath highly exalted him, and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee shall bow, of things in heaven and things in earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue shall confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. One day, the name of Jesus will be proclaimed from the throne of heaven. And when that precious name is uttered, the knee of every saint and angel will bow in worship and reverence. The knee of every sinner will bow in acknowledgement of his lordship and glory. And the knee even of every demon and Satan himself will bow in recognition that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, when we say his name, when we sing his name, when we breathe his name, when we whisper his name, when we shout his name, we proclaim the greatest name that has ever fallen on the ears of humanity. We proclaim the name of the Savior of the lost. We proclaim the name of the shepherd of the sheep. We proclaim the name of the redeemer of the soul. We proclaim the name of the blessed bridegroom of the bride and the lover of men's souls and of the one who calls himself our friend, the true and living Jesus. That's him. But he's so much more. In that precious name, in that name Jesus, there's hope and peace and love, and blessing, and healing, and wonder, and joy, and glory, and majesty, and even salvation. Thank God for that name, that lovely name Jesus, because it declares so much, and it marks the difference between life and death, hope and despair, even heaven and hell. And we thank God for that lovely name. And I want you to understand this morning as I close out, that name, for those of you who uh, do not know him and the pardoning of your sins, that name declares the first thing that you need to know about him. Jehovah or God is salvation. What are you talking about, preacher? It's in the name of Jesus and only in the name of Jesus that you can be saved from your sins. We already said it. It's the whole purpose of why he came, clothed in humanity, leaving his throne in heaven to come to earth to save you and I and all humankind from their sins. John 3.16 declares it so lovely. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Paul lets us know in Romans chapter 5, verse 8, the depth of this. He says, for God commended his love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Catch that this morning. Christ died for us. He willingly and obediently went to Calvary's cross to die for your sins. And the question I want to ask you this morning is simply this. If he was willing to die for you, are you willing to live for him? It's so easy to do so. It's so easy to start that process. 
You've heard his words. You heard how he came and how he died for your sins. In faith, believe what you've heard. In faith, repent of your sins. In faith, confess that Jesus is the Christ and that he's the son of God. And in faith, be buried in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of all of your sins. And if you live from that moment in faith, one day heaven will be yours in eternity. Maybe you are a child of this morning, but you haven't lived up to that name. And whatever your shortfalls are this morning, uh, I just understand that we've all fallen short of the glory of God at one point or another because we've all sinned. First John chapter one lets us know that. But even while you have fallen, God stands ready to pick you back up, forgive you of all of your sins and restore you in a right relationship with him. So whatever your desire is this morning, I just beg you right now that you will reach out to us at the contact information that appears on your screen. And whatever it is, whatever your need is, we will help facilitate that need this morning. If it's prayer, we will pray with you. We will pray with you. If it's restoration back to the body, we will help you on that restoration journey. If it's coming to Christ for the remission of your sins and putting him on in baptism, we will reach out to you and make that happen this morning. If you will just reach out to us We'll reach out to you on that con with the contact information and facilitate whatever it is that needs to be done this morning. May the Lord bless you and keep you. We pray that you've been encouraged and edified and helped by this message this morning. That you know now the name Jesus and what all it declares, not only to you, but to all humanity. May the Lord bless you and keep you. God loves you. And we at the Church of Christ at Northside do too. And at this time, we're going to turn the services back over to those who are charged with carrying it further. Corinthians chapter 11, starting at verse 23, as we focus our hearts on the Lord's Supper. For I received of the Lord that which I also deliver unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he brake it and said, Take eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. For after the same manner also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye do show the Lord's death till he come. Wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup of the Lord unworthily shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Heavenly Father, 
we humbly bow and direct ourselves now by the example of thy dear Son and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ, asking your blessings on these emblems, this bread and cup, that represent your Son's broken body and shed blood, shed on the cross of Calvary for the remission of our sins. This in all grace, favor, and blessings we ask in his name. Amen. so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 11.
Heavenly Father, we once again approach your magnificent throne of grace. Thank you, Father, for allowing us to come together to worship you. 
We pray, Father, that while we are still absent one from one another, we ask, Father, that you just keep our minds and spirits up. And we pray, Father, that we remember to call one another and to encourage one another. Thank you for all that you have given us. And let us learn to count our blessings more than we count our troubles. In Jesus' name and in the Spirit's name, we pray. Amen. This ends our worship service online broadcast for today. We thank you for tuning in, and again, we hope that you were blessed in some way by joining us. We invite you each and every Sunday at 10.30 a.m., as well as our other weekday Bible study and prayer broadcast that are scheduled during this time. We continue to pray for your health and safety. We are located at 18460 Conant Avenue in the city of Detroit. Be blessed.